Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Our opening prayer is from the book of Ruth. May the Lord reward what you have done. May you receive a full reward from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. This presentation is coming to you from the Altar Care St. Joseph Center in Warrensville Heights, Ohio, in the Diocese of Cleveland. The St. Joseph Center is a health care facility with a wide range of services, from rehabilitation, occupational and physical therapy, short-term nursing care, long-term nursing care, hospice care, and palliative care. And this is a presentation about the Book of Ruth. This book is a gem. It's oftentimes not thought about. It doesn't show up in the lectionary too often, if at all. And it's a very short book. You can read it in just a few moments, really. It's probably only a couple of pages in your Bible, just four short chapters. And it's not something that would come to mind because of some great events or great people who are in it, things that are remembered about Uh, Bible history or that. But in a way, that's what makes it so interesting for a topic of study. It's great for a Bible study group because you don't need to know an awful lot of uh, history, Bible history. You don't have to know a lot of names or dates, anything like that. It's very simple in a way. And in that way, it can be sort of deceptive because really it's a very significant book in Bible history for it. And um, it's something, too, that is interesting because it's easy to study because you don't need to know a lot of facts or a lot of background. It's easy to follow. It isn't complicated in its plot or in all of the characters to keep track of. Also, too, there's no war in it, no violence, no blood, no gore as is often the case in the narrative parts of the Old Testament. So it lends itself very well to uh, some reflection and from, for some study. It's set in the time of the judges. The judges were a period in Israel's history before the monarchy, after they have come into the promised land and before uh, the first kings. So the setting is the time of about 1200 B.C. to about 1025 B.C. Saul is the first king and starts the monarchy, and then David and then Solomon and on through with some of those names that we know and some that are not so familiar. But the judges were basically people who were temporary rulers, some over some period of years, but there was no line of succession like the monarchy. Basically, they rose to the occasion when called by God because of a crisis or some other threat to the security of the nation of Israel. And it wasn't really a nation that was all totally unified as we might think of a nation today. It was rather a loose federation of the 12 tribes. And a judge would come from one of the tribes and would unite together perhaps just two or three or more of the tribes, perhaps all of the tribes if the threat was great enough. And when the threat was taken care of, when the enemy was no longer uh, at their gates, the judge would simply go back to their own tribe, 
Sometimes some would stay in power for a longer period of time. There were a number of them. And of course, the book of Judges speaks about them in uh, the Old Testament. Uh, amongst them was a, a, at least one woman, Deborah, and uh, she is spoken of in chapter 5 of the book of Judges. So this is the setting for this book of Ruth. It's not during the time of the great kings and the monarchy. And also, too, it's a good description of common, everyday, ordinary life. It doesn't deal with large cities, great events. There are no prophets, for instance. And there's no direct intervention of God, even, in the events that are talked about in the book of Ruth. So it's really a, a sort of different kind of book in that way. You have to shift gears a little bit uh, for it. It's not what you might expect. And this is also to which is uh, this is something that makes it very enduring for us and so interesting too in some ways. The story of Ruth would have been told by uh, oral storytellers in festivals in villages and in small towns. It could also be in the larger cities later on as well, but it really begins on a much smaller scale. It was done by those who were uh, storytellers, as I said, and not necessarily by great figures. Again, there are no prophets that are spoken about, no king is mentioned, uh, not even of the priests either. It's very simple and very ordinary. But that can be a little bit uh, deceptive because it's also very subtle. It is very significant in the history of Israel, as we will see for uh, in a few moments with it. The date when it is written is much later than this time of the judges. Again, the judges are about from 1200 to 1025 BC. And remember in BC, it goes without saying, but it's good to say it the uh, dates were going in backwards in a sense. So as the numbers go down, we get closer and closer uh, in history to the time of Christ. And then, of course, the numbers go up after the time of Christ as we come into our centuries here. So uh, again, just to keep that in mind, it sometimes can be overlooked and it might make it a little bit complicated for it. So the actual writing of this story, first told orally, but then finally committed to its composition is about 900 to 750 BC. So later than the events that are recounted for it. And it would seem to be the earlier part of that range. So around 900 BC, some would even go out a little further to 950 BC for it. It's not influenced by the Aramaic language, so it's not later. It has very, very few characteristics of later times. In other words, closer to the time of the coming of Christ. So again, the range coming down less than uh, before. Remember going in the opposite direction with the numbering for that. There are archaisms in it. And also, too, there are some explanations that something is done because this is the way they used to do it. If you read through there, you'll see an example or two of that. So it's written after the events that it is talking about for it. And we've got to remember, too, that as it's talking about what the legal affairs were or what the laws were or what the customs were, that doesn't mean necessarily that it has to be dated to when the laws were codified. The practices, the legal practices, could very much predate when they actually became codified in the law. They would be in effect beforehand and then finally become part of their written law. So to keep this in mind, to try to keep a perspective and a context for this. Again, explanations are needed because the book is talking about practices that had no longer been used or followed in Israel. So they have to explain, well, this is the way we used to do it for that to help people. The book is used during the time of the Feast of Weeks, 
during the time of the beginning of the barley harvest, the end of the wheat harvest, because that's what is the situation that we find in the book itself. So it's used later on during the observance of those feasts, especially the Feast of Weeks for it. Okay, now, is it historical? It's hard to track down the details because dealing with just common, ordinary life without great events or great figures, it's hard to pin it to a certain particular time. Very hard to track down. What we can say is that it's eminently plausible as far as its history. And as a matter of fact, when we finally do come to the end of it, we see exactly where it does fall within the history. And as a matter of fact, it is very important, as I said, for that history. Some have looked at it and said, is it poetic? It doesn't seem to be poetic. It certainly doesn't come down to us in that way. It's more like prose with it. Uh, if you try to make it into something poetic, you've got to break the rules of grammar and you've got to force the text a little bit. It's just simply like a short story, like a short essay. Some have called it a novella because it is so brief for it. But it is also, too, a great piece of literature, a great piece of uh, literary art. It speaks about uh, events, but it does it in a very artistic way. Now, a lot of this is lost in translation. Uh, I'll mention a couple of things here that are very clear in the original language of the Hebrew of it, but uh, would be lost in a modern translation. Some translations might be able to pick it up, maybe others not. So it's not only trying to instruct people about something of the history, but it's also entertaining. Now, again, it's a story, first to told orally, and it would be done at these festivals, and it would be something that would both entertain and instruct as well for it. You can look upon it as almost like a play, as an introduction and then five acts. The first act of the play is the journey to Bethlehem. The second act is Ruth and Boaz at the barley harvest. The third act is Ruth and Boaz at the threshing floor. The fourth act takes place at the city gate, and the fifth act speaks about the birth of a child. Uh, the second and third acts are the same as chapters two and three. And these chapters, these acts, open and close with Boaz, Noemi, and Ruth together. It makes sort of like a triangle. We have uh, some repetitions, too. The repetitions sort of bring out the story in the sense that they, they spin it out like a good yarn. They uh, take up some time, they repeat, they add a little bit of suspense, they uh, stretch it out a little bit. Again, not to make it boring, but rather to make it interesting. As you go through, even in its very short four chapters, you want to know more and what is going on. And it sort of not teases you, but again, good literary artistry. It's a great telling of a story for it. Uh, there are, is also a symmetry throughout the story as well. And so the symmetry, though, is something we're not too used to in modern literature. It's called a chiasm from the Greek letter X. If you think of the letter X and you take the four points of that from the upper left, upper right, lower left, lower right, and you give them letters A, B, B, A. And so they cross in a sense. And the symmetry is there. It's not A, B, A, B, but it's A, B, B, A. And so, for instance, in Chapter 2, Boaz will ask Ruth to stay and then blesses her. In chapter 3, he blesses her and then asks her to stay. So the opposite there, back and forth. It was a good part of classical style. It's found in many places 
within the Bible, especially in the Old Testament. It's also uh, something that was part of literary style in both Greek and Latin as well with that. So these symmetries that are in there. Amongst its themes are that of good character and relatives and the responsibility one has to one's relations, to one's relatives and to one's kin. And that good character will show. It'll be borne out in activity, not just spoken about, but actually will be put into practice for that. So the good character of both Boaz and Ruth, and it'll show and it'll make a difference. And Ruth and Boaz are, in a sense, a good foil for each other. And it's interesting that Boaz and Naomi never meet. The action is all through Ruth. And again, this sort of makes this triangle, Boaz, Naomi, and Ruth between them. And so between Boaz and uh, Ruth and between Ruth and Noemi without Noemi and Boaz actually coming together. The last verse of chapter 1 summarizes all of chapter 1. The last verse of chapter 2 ends with a harvest. The last verse of chapter 3 leads right into chapter 4. And then the results of all of it in the last chapter the civil process, and then childbirth. The framework of all of this is the covenant, the relationship between God, Yahweh, and his people Israel, and the obligations that come out of the covenant. But it's interesting, if you read the book of Ruth, while God is mentioned a couple of times, he really doesn't directly intervene in the story which is interesting, especially for a book of the Bible. But that's part of one of the themes about the book itself. It's very subtle, but it's very clear as well. And so God is there. He's very much in the background. He's very much in control. But he's not to the forefront of the activity. Like, say, for instance, in the book of Exodus, where he's very, very much involved in freeing his people. And all his activities in Genesis, with the call of Abraham, and anywhere else in the narrative of the Old Testament. Here he's in the background. It happens in the other parts of narrative as well. But here it's in the whole book. You don't really find God to the forefront. But yet you know he's still there, which is kind of an interesting thing. And there's much to reflect upon then for this, because this is a story of a family. And so... It says something about family life. It says something about family obligations. And it can be a message for families today, even though it's far, far removed in context and time historically from us now. It still talks about family values and family virtues. And basically, it's a story about people finding their way without having a direct revelation from God through a prophet or through uh, the priests or through a king that's going to tell them exactly what to do. They've got to find it out on their own, but they're really not on their own because they have the law and the covenant to guide them. And so by observing the law, by fulfilling the obligations of the covenant, They, in a sense, work out for themselves what is God's will for them and what is best for them. And so as we, on our pilgrimage of life, try to figure out what is it that God wants us to do, we don't get direct revelation from God. But we do have, of course, the Gospels and the Church to guide us and to help us along. And we've got to find our way. We've got to listen to the promptings of the Holy Spirit, but he's not going to come down and speak to us, in a sense, directly. But it'll be through the Bible, through the church, through its sacraments, through our prayer, through our meditation, that we reflect 
and we try to figure out what is God calling me to do? What is the best thing to do here? Sometimes we may find the answer easily, sometimes not. Sometimes we might have to look and sometimes events will not go the way that we want them to. Sometimes we won't be able to control all the parts of our destiny. And the book of Ruth talks about these kinds of things as you see what's happening as the characters try to find their way and make their way through these events that are going on. There are uh, many literary devices. I've mentioned the chiasm. There's uh, a lot of word play. There are double occurrences of the same word. Again, good literary style, but it helps to draw out the story, to tease it out a little bit and to extend it. There's repetitions of words, uh, that for it. Uh, some of these other chiasms, for instance, and again, your translation may not show it, but it is in the original language, this A-B-B-A chiasm. In chapter 1, verse 3, the text speaks about husband and boys. In chapter 1, verse 5, it then speaks about boys and husband. So A, husband, B, boys, B, boys, A, husband. Does it again in chapter 1 and verse 8. Speaks about go, return. Chapter 1, verse 12, return, go. A, go, B, return, B, return, A, go. And yet another one, again in chapter 1, verse 9, a kiss and a lament. In verse 14, a lament and a kiss for that. So these kinds of things are part of good writing for it, a part of the artistry, but they also help to convey the message as well. Again, it is teaching and it is entertaining at the same time. The characters act very much within their roles. Boaz is like the patriarch. Uh, the characters are true to form in their roles. And again, that makes it very true to life. It is not something where you've got to, in a sense, uh, suspend reason or that uh, in order to uh, understand it or for it to make sense. It's very, very understandable for it. But that doesn't make it necessarily plain either. It deals with very important themes, this idea of community, that one's identity is found in the community, that we are responsible for our actions, and we have a certain amount of freedom. And we'll find other themes spoken about as well. God is a part of all of this, but he's in the background. And we see the characters develop. Naomi starts out complaining, but yet her complaint turns to joy. She becomes uh, very much a part of this story, uh, the grandchild that is born, everything that's a part of this. It changes from her complaining and her wondering what's going to happen, her worries, her frustration, to great joy and rejoicing again in a family and in the increase in the family with the birth of the child. And God, the God of Israel, is hidden behind all of this. He's mentioned, but we don't see him directly intervening in these events. But we know he's guiding them all. And these people who are in here, the members of this family, they are in the providence of God. It's a real-life situation but in ordinary events. Sometimes you might say mundane events, but yet we're going to find these are very significant. This family is very important, but we'll have to get to the end of the story to find that. It's also saying then that the very ordinary things of one's life are a concern for God's providence as well. And so God is present in everything and everywhere. He is 
and his providence is working in the ordinary, mundane, simple things of life, as well as in the great and tremendous events that might be going on as well. Some of the other reasons that have been put forward for the writing of this book is to speak about uh, the idea of Ruth in that she was a foreigner. She was a Moabite. And uh, at other times in Israel's history, marriages to foreigners were looked down upon. But that's much later. After the exile, which again was in the 500s BC, and remember this is written in around the 900s BC, dealing with a situation back uh, before 1000 BC, the uh, prohibition against foreign wives was in order to preserve the faith after they came back from the exile and trying to start over again. Ezra and Nehemiah will speak about that. But that's all later. So it doesn't seem that the book of Ruth is concerned with those kinds of issues at all. However, we are going to find that Ruth is very important in the story of King David. And so it is a way of explaining the foreign ancestry, a little bit of foreign ethnic ancestry that's part of David's line for that. So that has an interest in there. And to say that that was not a problem or a difficulty, as some might have seen it to be with that. Uh, Some look upon it as being uh, some kind of consolation for those who were in exile, that God's providence extends beyond just the people of Israel, can extend to the Moabites and to others as well. But again, the exile is much later. And even the exile of the northern kingdom is later as well. That happens in 721 B.C. And this is already written, again, in that range of around 900, 950 B.C. So that doesn't seem to be uh, part of what is going on here. Although if you read a commentary on the book of Ruth, you will see some are talking about the idea of foreign wives or a consolation of the exiles as such. It doesn't seem to be that as well uh, as some other things that might come through there. It's basically about ordinary life at this time of the judges. But the significance of some of those events that are there. It also speaks about the law again and covenant. And there's something else we need to take a moment to think about because this would seem very strange to us. It comes up in other stories as well, but it's important here in the book of Ruth. And that's the idea of uh, of the marriage, a marriage within a family when someone, uh, one of the people has died. Okay, so bear with me a little bit as I try to explain this background. It's very, very important in the Jewish law and tradition, and it's very operative here but may seem extremely strange to us. It comes up in the Joseph story as well and in other places. Now, go back to the time of Genesis and when God calls Abraham, and this is the start of the Jewish nation, its people, uh, it's back in uh, the earlier chapters of Genesis. And the promises given to Abraham are twofold. He is promised land and he's promised descendants. These are the two best things that could be promised to someone in the ancient time of Abraham. To have land that you can call your own uh, so that you have a, a place to possess so that you're not always like a wandering nomad but you can settle down Uh, put down roots, able then to build cities and a civilization. You have some stability in your life. You have a place to call home. You also have a place where you can grow food, your crops, uh, plant vines, fruits, trees, and have a place to have pasture land so that you can have flocks 
And of course, then that gives you your food, your substance, your subsistence. So land is very important. Then descendants help you to keep your name, your family going. To also defend your land, to have people, to have descendants, enough relatives and such to defend your land. And so the commitment to your relatives is very important. So land and descendants. This is promised to Abraham. Now, as this works out in their tradition and in their laws, if, for instance, someone would die, say, early, before they could have sons, especially, to have descendants, to keep the family line, the family name going, and to be able to protect the land and also to till it, to cultivate it and such. It was allowed, and it was considered an obligation, for someone in the family to marry the widow of the person in the family who died in order to keep the land and to keep the descendants going. Okay, now, the children would be considered from a legal point of view as the descendants of that deceased person. Now, they knew that obviously, genetically and biologically, you know, that they would be the children of another person, in a sense, they'd be stepchildren. They understood that, they knew that. But from a legal point of view, these children would be considered to be the descendants of the person who had died. So, say for instance, someone dies, they were married, but they did not have heirs, that could take over the property, keep the name going. Another relative, perhaps the brother of the man who died, would marry and raise children for the sake of his dead brother, that legally they would be considered that dead brother's children. That's very hard for us to understand. And they knew that, you know, actually it what it was, they wouldn't have all the uh, explanation we would have of the biology and everything, but they knew uh, what it was. But again, in legal terms, okay, this is a situation for the book of Ruth, for that, that uh, the, and it's made very clear in the first chapters, as you could read it through, I'm not going to read it all through and take the time for that. But if you take a look, you will see that that's the situation that is there. Okay, so they want to keep this land and they want to have descendants as well. That sets up the whole story and it's brought out very clearly in chapter one. But you got to keep that in mind. So what's happening there is to be able to have children to be considered the descendants of the man who died. For that now they would be stepbrothers and sisters to others and that that's not operative here the idea is for the one who died to keep the line going and to keep the land in the family that's the whole context that's happening here so these people are related the one who did that was called the redeemer he redeemed or saved the family and saved the land for the family. He was the one who redeemed it. And so that title is used here. And most all the modern translations do use it. Uh, so that's what's going on. That's the whole rationale behind what is here uh, in this. And again, it sounds strange to us, but to them it made a lot of sense. And it was preserving that promise to Abraham, land and descendants. So you've got to keep that in mind. And that's being presumed in the book of Ruth. They would have known that. 
that that's what it's about. That's what's being talked about. Again, I'm going to talk about the story of Joseph in uh, a later uh, presentation, and this will come back up again in a different uh, in a different way, but with the same basic ideas uh, for it. So keep that in mind. I'm making, as a Scottish friend of mine would say, I'm making heavy weather of this, but you really need to have it clear in your mind that that is what they were understanding and presupposing with the whole setting for this book of Ruth. It's the idea of keeping the name and keeping the land. And that's why this has to be done for this. So those are the rules, the laws. That's about it uh, as far as what is specified. And it comes out of the covenant relationship because with the covenant with Abraham, the promises are the land and the descendants for it. And it stays all, all the way through uh, Jewish history for this. Okay. So that's what's happening there. And uh, that's why the birth of the child and the keeping of the land is the way that the story ends. And that's the whole purpose for this, or at least one of the purposes, not the only purpose, but very, very important part of this for it. Okay. So given that, then, let's get back into the story itself for it. The way the providence works through all of this, uh, of what's going on, and God's part in this. Another very important theme for the book of Ruth is the concept, the Hebrew word hesed, H-E-S-E-D, hesed. It's hard to translate into English. It's the idea of uh, loving kindness or faithful love. It's throughout the Old Testament. And it's the idea of God's faithful love, his providence, his acting to save his people out of this faithful love uh, and the importance of that. Now, it's important in the book of Ruth, but an interesting thing here in the book of Ruth, while God is praised and blessed for his hesed, it's the people who carry it out and make it happen. And that's an important thing, too. Again, it isn't the uh, direct intervention of God or a prophet or the priest doing things. It's these ordinary, if you will, regular people who are doing the things here. But they are doing it, and in doing it, they are carrying out God's hesed his faithful love. So they talk about it, but they do it. They actually do it. They make it happen. And God works through them. Again, something very important to think about in our own lives. How does God act in our own lives? Oftentimes through the generosity or the charity uh, or the concern of other people, other people who come to help us, we thank God for that. It's the same kind of thing that is happening here uh, for this. So many things that we can relate to, even though this is thousands of years difference in time, the situation is different, the presuppositions are different, yet still humanity is the same in many, many ways for it. So the importance of that, and to keep some of that in mind, is you try to make uh, connections to it. That's why this is a great story to use for a Bible study, because it can be in so many ways so contemporary to what's going on for it, these very real life situations uh, for it. So to go through it then uh, with this, again, we can't go through it uh, line by line, but the situation that is going on with this, uh, what's going on behind this for it. Now, so we find the situation in chapter one. It's set up that uh, with Naomi and with Ruth and they're traveling through and the other characters that are in here, but uh, Ruth stays with Naomi. So there are possibilities. There are different possibilities. The other person that's in here that's part of this uh, with Ruth, she goes back. 
All right. It doesn't mean that she's abandoning Naomi, but the situation, such as it is, we've got to remember the social context there uh, for these women. Uh, very much, uh, we can see it's different than what our situation is here. They did not have as many options, obviously, that women have today. Uh, it was very, very difficult for them to make their way, and for a widow especially. And so that's why, for instance, throughout the Old Testament, God has a special affection and providence for three groups of people, the poor, widows, and orphans. And here it will be for the widows and uh, the importance of that. So we've got this situation of what they should do and where they should go. Best option for them is to go to their relatives. And so they do that. And Boaz and Ruth meet. Again, another part of Jewish tradition is in chapter 2 that they would have known very well. And it's found in other places in the Old Testament. When they would go and harvest, the law said you went through once. You didn't go back a second time. If there was anything left from your barley or your wheat harvest or when you picked the grapes or the olives off the trees or the vines, you went through once and you left whatever you missed for the poor, the widow, or the orphan to come in and they could have what was left. If there were things with, that you missed or that, that was theirs. And they could take that. You couldn't go back and clean it up a second time. You left it for those who were at a disadvantage. And that's exactly what happens here. And not only that, but Boaz is even beyond that. Not only does he make sure that nobody bothers Ruth, nobody molests her, takes advantage of her or anything, but also to she is able to be right there uh, right amongst those who are taking and clearing and harvesting and such. So he is very generous to her and she has enough for herself and even to take some for Naomi. So he is very, very much concerned about her. Again, his good character. He is a gentleman in so many, many ways and he's following the law. And he doesn't have to be reminded of it for that. So that's what sets up the situation in the chapter. And then Naomi and Ruth talk of what's going to happen and figures out, well, you know, this is a relative here. And again, the importance of family and to have this redeemer. So not only will it be that uh, someone will be able to protect Ruth, but also, too, she will then have someone that she can become part of this family. Uh, and she will have children as well. And that will keep the family going and the land and everything that Naomi and has. And that would be able to stay within the family. This is a good solution. So she's got to, in a sense, date him <laughs> if you want to look at it that way. And it's spoken of in terms of how they did that. Uh, to put the cloak over was uh, saying, you know, to protect someone. And he does this at the threshing floor. And it's interesting here, too, because, again, very true to life, there's temptation. There is temptation. And Boaz is very careful to tell Ruth, go back before anybody can start to tell stories or talk about this. It's said in the text uh, to go back before one can recognize another. words, while it's still dark, make your way back and get away from here while it's still dark. Nobody sees you so that nobody starts to gossip. That's basically what's happening there. So true to life. But he is so concerned about her reputation. He is a man of honor for it. But there is temptation and they do not succumb to it. And so the chastity and the modesty that is there, it's another part of good character that's spoken about. Again, subtle, but very clear in some ways.
And so Naomi tells Ruth how you've got to, you know, woo him and that of things to do and, and stuff. And it comes back and reports what the date was like and everything. And that's so, so simple, so true to life, uh, sometimes amusing in some ways as well for it. So we see how the plot develops there and what Boaz wants to do. Now, there's a twist in the plot. This time, it's uh, misunderstood by many commentators. There is another relative, and we don't know this relative's name, but he's closer in the line to uh, the situation than Boaz. Okay, now, what's he going to do? Boaz very much, we find, is in love with Ruth. But yet, this other kinsman, as the translation sometimes says, has the, the right, has a preference in the Jewish law to be the one to be the redeemer. What is Boaz going to do? Now, we don't know much at all about this other relative. We don't know how much more or less this other relative knows about Boaz's love for Ruth. Did he know? Did he suspect? What's he going to do? He's the one that's next in line. He has first preference as to what he wants to do to fulfill this obligation to raise up children to their dead relative. Again, in the legal view, the children would be the descendants of the dead relative. That's the way that it would work for this. So this is the situation. This is the plot twist that's going to have to be worked out. It's in chapter 4. So what's going to happen? How's it going to work out? What's going to be the result? The thing that is misunderstood is simply that for many commentators, this other relative is considered the villain in the story. And he's the one that should do it, and he doesn't do it for very selfish reasons. He says, no. Now, it happens to work out then to Boaz's advantage. But is that other relative the villain? I go along with many other commentators very strongly saying, no, he is not the villain. He is not selfish. As a matter of fact, he is just the opposite. He too is a gentleman and a man of good character. And he shows by his deeds that good character. He is not in any way one who is just selfish, thinking about himself, and it just happens to turn out very well for Boaz and Ruth. No, not at all. He is rather that redeemer, but he also is a very realistic man. And does he know about Boaz's love for Ruth? We don't know. We really don't know. And whether he did or whether he didn't, he still acted well. And so in the next part of this presentation in the book of Ruth. We'll see how the story turns out and we'll see about these characters and why this becomes so important. So stay tuned. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.